Hello Shiloh Church, great to see you for another week of church. Really, really exciting time in the life of our church. We've just uh, come off the back of our Miracle Weekend, which is incredible. A lot of really great stuff happened in that weekend. Our giving is still open for a couple of weeks for those whose giving is structured differently or who need to get a pledge in. So call our office if you need more details about that or shoot us a message. We would love to help you out with that. On top of that, uh, we have finished the winter season. Spring is uh, heating up and we're getting into the summer months, which for some of you is wonderful. And for others of you, you just are turning on your air conditioner. That's definitely the category that I feel uh, that I fit into. Praise God for that. Also an exciting week because this week, for those who um, didn't catch it online, uh, Kim Forbes, Luke and Christina Munns and their two beautiful girls and my wife Krista and my two beautiful boys have all made it safely over the border into Queensland. They're all in hotel quarantine right now, so be praying for them uh, as they navigate the challenges of quarantine. But in a couple of weeks time, they're going to be out of quarantine and in our service. Hand emojis in the air. Praise Jesus for that. Hallelujah. But it's a two-part sermon I was saying last week, and this is the second part. And so if you've missed the first part, chill out. You don't need to like check out or, um, or, or, or you know, go into another video or whatever. I'll fill you in Netflix style. Let me tell you what happened last week. So basically, um, Jesus has died. The Holy Spirit hasn't yet come. Jesus has now risen from the dead, but the Holy Spirit still hasn't come. So they're in a bit of a limbo. They've lost one of the disciples, Judas. He's no longer with us, he's, um, he's died. And so they need to replace Judas and they're looking for somebody to replace. They're looking to take a nobody and make that person a somebody. Uh, my title for the sermon today is When God Chooses Nobodies to Become Somebodies. And I think it's, a, it's something that we can all relate to because there are times that we all feel like we're a nobody. We all feel like we're going nowhere. We all feel like we're in a grind and it's just not happening and we're waiting for our moment to shine. So um, let me read to you what happened last week and then we'll pick it up this week. So Acts chapter 1 verses 21 to 26. Acts chapter 1 verses 21 to 26. When you've got it in your Bible type, got it into the chat. Uh, if you need a minute, um, I'll wait for you. If you don't have a Bible or you're driving or you're doing something, I've got my Bible with me. I will read it to you. <clears throat> this is what it says. Acts 1, 21 to 26. So now we must choose a replacement for Judas from among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus. From the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken from us. Whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. So they, are, so they nominated two men, Joseph called Basabius, known as Justius, and Matthias. All right, so they've, they've held a meeting. The disciples, 11 of them, are there. They're like, we've got to pick somebody to replace Judas. And um, check out the message last week on our podcast page or hit us up on YouTube. Watch a prior message if you missed it. But this is what we're up to this week. Verse 24. Then they all prayed, O Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen. Pause. Number one, type number one if you're uh, watching this, you're on the chat. Number one, you are not in competition when God is choosing. You are not in competition when God is choosing. You know, there's a saying that has permeated every part of our culture as a society. And the saying is this, the saying is that dog eat dog, or it's a dog eat dog world, right? It's every man for himself. You know, uh, you better get yours before somebody else does. And it means that we're in a world of competition. You're in a world of competition in your business. You're in a world of competition at school. You're in a world of competition in the, in the rat race of life, as they say. But the thing is, the kingdom of God is different. God doesn't actually think like that. You know, here we have two guys, both really good quality guys. These are guys that have followed Jesus's ministry for three years. They've seen him preach sermon after sermon. They've seen him do miracle after miracle. <clears throat> They've done the whole thing. And after three years, notice that the guys didn't gather and say, well, made the best man win. They didn't get them to arm wrestle each other. They didn't get pit them up against each other. They didn't weigh up pros and cons. No, 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 no. What they did was they said, now we've got these two great candidates. We are going to let God choose which of these men should actually take a shot at uh, replacing Judas as one of the disciples. And so they prayed to God. They asked God, they, they stepped into God and they said, God, we need you to answer this question. So, you know, I've been thinking about that, right? And if we're not in a world of competition, if you're not up against everybody else, 
that changes a few things. First thing is it changes the way we look at other people. Like, do you see other people as your competition? Do you see yourself up against other people? Do you um, tend to pick sides in life? Do you say, well, because I love this person, I'm going to hate that person, or because I hate that person, I'm going to love this person? Um, You know, it's one of the saddest things I think in our society, in our culture right now over the last 10 or 15 years is how divided we've become as a nation, how divided we've become as a planet, right? I think it's terrible. People used to just agree to disagree and move on. People used to just say, oh, well, like we don't get along on that point, but we can get along on all the other points. So let's just get along in that way. But sadly, what's happened in our society is it's become such a competitive society. The dog eat dog, you know, you got to go get yours type culture has permeated our society. And the problem with that is now we are at war with each other. And I think that's incredibly sad. Like, for example, um, if, if, if we look at politics, right? Uh, Just because you love ScoMo does not mean you have to hate every Labor leader or vice versa, right? Um, Competitive thinking doesn't stop there, though. It goes into the workplace. Uh, For example, I remember I was working in a corporation and we swapped department leaders. It was a pretty significant shift. And my, 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 did that cause things to just be turned upside down for a whole lot of people? They were like, well, I'm on his side and I'm on her side and all that kind of stuff, right? And they got all worked up. And I remember saying to people, you just need to chill out. We can love this person that's gone and love the new person that's here as well. They don't have to be in competition with each other. We don't have to pit ourselves against one another in our team based on who we like and who we don't like. We can just agree maybe that this leader is better than this leader, but you know, God is bigger than that. We've got to be bigger than that. You know, you can love Ipswich and not hate Brisbane, or you can love Brisbane and not hate Ipswich. We can actually love more than one thing at the same time when we're dealing with God because we're not in competition when God is choosing. They loved both of these two gentlemen. They thought both of them would be good candidates, but obviously they wanted the right one to be chosen. And so they said, God, we need you to step in. We need you to pick it. So how do you look at people that have opposing views to yours? How do you rate people that think differently to the way you do? Do you see them as competition or worse yet? Do you see them as your enemies? Um, You know, the thing is, you've got to remember as Christians, we're at war with the devil. We're not at war with people. We're at war with the enemy. We're not at war with our brothers and sisters or people out there in the world. And that's because we need to understand something, that um, you're not in competition when God is choosing. You're not in competition when God is choosing. So the other thing I think to keep in mind is if you're not in competition when God is choosing, how do you see yourself? How do you rate yourself? How do you value yourself in that way? Do you see yourself as up against that other girl for the promotion? Do you see yourself as pitted against that guy to win that girl's heart? Do you see yourself as pushing against that other company because you've got to win that business? You see, you're not in competition when God is choosing. When God is promoting you, it's God that's in charge. When God is elevating you, it's God that is in charge. When God is picking you, it's God that is in charge. And it's, it's fascinating because sometimes even as Christians, even as believers, although we intellectually understand this, we don't actually get it in our heart. And as a result, our behavior is a little bit warped. See, if you know that God is actually the one promoting and demoting, if you know the one that God is, you know, if you know that God is the one that's elevating and lifting people up and that it rests on God, then one of the things that changes is you should try to please God and not try to please man. And yet what often happens with believers is we try to please the wrong person, the wrong party, the wrong decider. And we try to please other people. We try to impress other people. Yet the most important person to impress when you're in a moment where God is choosing, when you're in a moment where you're up against somebody else, the most important person to impress is God, is Jesus. Now, the thing about God, though, let me give you the inside tip, is God is impressed by different things to people. People are are impressed and blown away by exterior things. The car you drive, the clothes you wear, you know, um, you know, your physical appearance, um, how charismatic you are when you talk to other people, you know, um, how well you present yourself in a meeting, like all of that, that exterior stuff, right? That's the stuff that impresses people in general. 
God isn't like that though. What impresses God, what, 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 what works for God, if you're going to try and win God over, is God is impressed by people's hearts and by the things that happen in people's hearts. So God is impressed by the attitude in your heart. God is impressed by the grace in your heart. God is impressed by the holiness in your heart. God is impressed by the peace you carry in your heart. God is impressed by that kind of stuff. So let me give you the inside tip. If you want to win God over, if you want to impress God, if you feel like you know, you're believing for something, you're striving for something, Something, you're going for elevation in an area, then if you've got to win God over on that, win God over on your heart. <clears throat> That's the stuff that he cares by. That's the stuff that he's impressed by. Um, that, like For example, we, we talked to, um, about this a while ago. Uh, you could write a check for $50,000 to the homeless, but if you're a mongrel, God doesn't, God doesn't find that that impressive. He says, yeah, 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 yeah. You're giving that great check. That's wonderful. But your motivation is you want everyone to pat you on the back and see what a legend you are that you gave 50 grand. And so God sees the heart and God calls it out at that point and says, yeah, the action is good. The exterior thing is good. I see all that. I'm not, I'm not devaluing that, but it's your heart that's a concern, right? So uh, God is impressed by the heart. God is impressed by the things that you can't see. God is impressed by that kind of stuff. And so with God, you're not in competition when God is choosing because God can read through the heart. God does know. God does understand. God does see the stuff that other people don't see. God does see the sacrifices that you've given that other people don't see, that other people don't rate, that other people don't value. God values those things. Hallelujah. So if you're believing for a big promotion or an increase in your business world or a shift in your relationships and so on, that's totally fine. I don't think that that's an issue at all. But let me tell you, as a believer of Jesus Christ, as a Christian, as somebody who follows Jesus, let me give you the inside tip here. All that stuff is great. And it's not that God doesn't care about that. But what God cares about more than your promotion, your car, your job, your house, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, what God cares about more than all of that is your heart and what is going on inside your heart. And because of that, you're not in competition when God is choosing. He knows what's in your heart and he'll pick what's best. So let's keep going. So they're praying, show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry, for he deserted us and has gone where he belongs. So they cast lots, pause, they cast lots. Um, it's a very interesting part of scripture this bit and it's actually a little bit debated by scholars as to exactly what this phrase means so some say that that meant that they were praying and then they cast their vote as to who they felt like god was saying was the right candidate for the job out of these two men that's what some people think um but the most commonly held view is that basically they had a random chance game to decide who would be it typically in that culture and that day and age what they would do is they would take two stones and they would write the name of each individual on the stone. So Matthias and Justice, right? And then they would get like a, um, like a large uh, urn or like a clay pot or something and they put it in there and they'd shake them up and they'd wait for one of the rocks just to fly out once they were shaking it up. And whatever um, got flown out, whatever rock hit the ground, they'd pull it up and whatever name that was, they'd be like, okay, that's what God has chosen. And um, it, it's crazy because uh, this is literally how they made a lot of decisions. Now, before anybody gets a wise idea to hit pause on their video, run into the kitchen, grab an urn, go into your neighbor's garden, steal two of their rocks because yours are too important, write the names of a couple decisions. Do I go here or do I go there? And shake up the urn, chill, 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 chill. This is before the Holy Spirit, right? Once the Holy Spirit was here, they stopped doing silly stuff like this because they had the Holy Spirit to rely on to speak to them. And we've got the Holy Spirit to rely on us to speak to us. But Prior to the Holy Spirit, this was actually a really common method for making big decisions. And what they would do is they would pray beforehand. They would believe beforehand. They would often even fast beforehand and say, God, we don't want it to be random chance. We want what happens to be dictated and directed by you. It's actually referred to all over the Bible. Um, for example, in Proverbs 16, 33, this is what it says. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Another translation puts it like this. We may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. So they relied on this random method for picking the replacement for one of the 12 disciples. Pretty crazy, right? <clears throat> Which brings me to my next point. Number two, if you're taking notes, type number two into the chat room. Type number two. You might even type the number. You might type the word, but whatever. Number two, random chance isn't random with God. Random chance isn't random with God. 
God moved in the most random of details. God, uh, God took a couple of stones in the urn that was shaken up a little pot and a couple stones and God used that situation to decide one of the most critical appointments probably in the world at that point in time. God was in that. God was moving, which I think is very important. The lesson for that in all of us is that God is in the details. God is in the randomness. God is in the things that other people don't care about. The things that you think don't matter. The things that you think aren't important. The things that you gloss over about. God is in all of those things. Random chance isn't random with God. Random chance isn't random with God. You see, sometimes we miss God because we're looking for Him in the big things. We miss God because we're looking for Him in the, <clears throat> the clouds at night and the angel visitation visitations and when's Jesus going to come into my bed and say, hey, you know, that's a dumb decision. Don't do that. Or when am I going to encounter the presence of God so thick I've got to pull over and, you know, uh, when I'm driving and it's all those kind of like big encounters. We're looking for all of that. And it's true. God is actually in those things and God does want to show you a sign. But sometimes God actually moves in the small things. God moves in the little things. God moves in the things that you think are random. God moves in the things that you think aren't important. God moves in the little stuff that you just gloss over in your life. <clears throat> so maybe you're here and you're, you're watching this and you're, you're listening to this on a podcast and you're like going, man, my life just feels mundane. Let me encourage you, look for God in the mundane. Look for God in the random details. Look for God in the little things because he is moving even in that. A couple stones in an urn, he was moving and bringing one of the greatest appointments in the world at that point in time. God can move in your life. God can move in the random things. I wonder... What random things is God currently orchestrating in your life? What random things is God currently moving in in your life right now? What things are you not noticing that God's hands and God's fingerprints are all over? So uh, you want to know how I met Krista? So she was supposed to be talking to my sister on MSN. All of the um, old school chat people will know what that is. It's a little chat program before Facebook Messenger. There was MSN Messenger was way cooler because you could play games on it. Not like Facebook games, they were way better. Um, anyway, so she was supposed to be chatting to my sister on MSN Messenger. And uh, there was a bit of a mix up and she got connected to me and we started talking. And it might have seemed like random chance. It might have just seemed like just a little detail, like, oh, that just doesn't matter. But God was in the details and praise the Lord for that. I am the luckiest fella in the whole world that I got to marry Krista. But it happened because of a random chance of me connecting with her when she was supposed to be talking to my sister. Um, you know, I was thinking about how I got my first big corporate job in the city. You know how that happened? I was talking to a stranger about my work goals and just 15 minutes beforehand, he'd gotten off the phone with his daughter, who was a big HR manager in a massive corporation and they had had someone resign and she needed a replacement fast. And he said, I should call my daughter. He picked up the phone and called her and a couple weeks later I was working in the city. Random? Hmm. I learned so much of what I know now about church, leadership and structure and governance and all of that kind of stuff from that particular job. And it's fascinating that it happened because of a random encounter with a stranger. Random isn't random when God is doing things. You know, um, uh, you know how uh, we figured out how to get Krista and the kids and everybody else over the border? Krista's account she had a little gov account that she got set up to sort of track what was happening with our border stuff. She got locked out. For some reason, the password didn't work and the password resets didn't work. So she called up to speak to the IT company to figure out how she could get back into her account. And they couldn't figure it out either. But in the conversation, they figured out a loophole to be able to get Krista and Luke and Christina and Kim and all of the kids over the border. Random? Maybe. Maybe not. See, I think God is in the random details. I don't think random is random when you're dealing with God. Random chance isn't random with God. God is in the most random of details. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to talk to God and he's going to point out all of these little things that we've missed, all of these little situations that we've missed. I believe in your life right now, there are little details. There are little things that God is moving in. The Holy Spirit is weaving himself in and out of situations. And we can tend to miss that. Random chance, small, seemingly random details, random encounters. You know, one of my prayers as a Christian is God help me to be more aware of your presence. And that doesn't just mean that, you know, when I'm praying that angels walk in the room. What it means is that sometimes God's presence is moving in the most random of details. I got this car spot in there instead of 
this car spot. I struck up a conversation with this stranger randomly. I bumped into this person down the street that I wasn't expecting to see. I got this phone call. That person dropped into my office. See, I believe that God is in all of those things. Random chance isn't random with God. <clears throat> And so as I scroll through um, my status updates on Facebook, or as I pitch songs on Spotify, I'm always looking, is the presence of God in this moment? Is God actually doing something right now? Because God is moving in your life. God is moving in my life. God is moving in the church's life in the most random of details. It goes on. Last line. And Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other 11. Come on, give us a shout on the chat. Um, throw your hand emojis in the air. This is the moment he gets, he gets finally gets his chance. He's been selected after three years of a roller coaster of emotions, three years of feeling painfully that he had missed out, three years feeling like his shot was never going to come, three years of following Jesus going, when am I going to get selected? When am I going to have my moment? When am I going to be one of the cool guys? Three years of watching Jesus take his 12 disciples and go out in the boat and Matisse would just be there just watching as they went out on the water, standing on the other side going, oh, I would love to be in the boat. I'd kill to be in the boat. Of Three years of getting up early, three years of having to be self-motivated, three years of doing the grind, Three years of feeling like he was a nobody. Three years of feeling like he was rejected. Three years of feeling like his life was going nowhere. Three years of wondering, where is God in the randomness of my life? Where is God moving in the details? Three years of feeling like he was in competition with everybody else and it was a competition that he was losing. Three years of chasing down the presence of God where it, it felt like it just was never going to happen. It didn't 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 happen. And then finally this moment happens and he gets selected. Number three, if you're taking notes, number three, type number three in the chat. Don't give up too early. Sometimes it takes years to bloom. Don't give up too early. Sometimes it takes years to bloom. He didn't give up. He didn't walk away. He didn't quit. It was, he was like a flower waiting for his moment to bloom. He, he, he kept dealing with setback after setback, day after day. After the first year, he didn't bloom, but he kept pushing. After the second year of feeling like he rejected because he didn't bloom, he kept pushing. After the third year of feeling like he wasn't blooming and all the other flowers around him was blooming, he didn't give up. He kept pushing. He kept grinding it out. He kept slogging it out because he believed that his moment was going to come. See, I bet the whole time he probably thought I could be one of Jesus' 12 disciples. I could make this happen. And he kept pushing. He kept grinding. He kept slogging it out. Even though he hadn't bloomed yet, he didn't give up when it got hard. He didn't give up when it looked like it didn't going to happen. He didn't give it up when, when, when it looked like other people were blooming and other people were flowering and other people were having their moment of summer and he was still stuck in winterland. He didn't give up. He kept pushing. He kept pushing. He kept pushing. Not only did, um, uh, you know, was God not fussed by him grinding it out because God knew that his time was, was coming. Even when Jesus died and rose from the dead, Matthias still kept grinding it out. God wasn't fussed then because God knew that it wasn't his moment three years ago. It wasn't his moment two years ago. It wasn't his moment a year ago. It wasn't his moment a week ago. His moment was now. And like a flower at just the right time, he opened up and he bloomed. <clears throat> you know, it's all about seasons in life. It's all about seasons in life. See, Matthias might have felt like he was being rejected, but that's actually not what was happening. That season was not a season to bloom. That was a season of preparation. That was a season where he was getting ready to bloom at another time. Maybe you feel like you've missed out. Maybe you feel like, well, I, I, I'm waiting for my moment. But maybe this season isn't about your moment. Maybe this season isn't about you blooming. Maybe this season isn't about your moment to shine or any of that kind of stuff at all. Maybe it's not about your 15 minutes of fame. Maybe it's not about your success in this moment. Maybe this is a season of preparation. This is a season where you're supposed to grind it out. This is a season where you're supposed to feel like a bit of a nobody. This is a season where it does challenge your insecurities and does challenge your feelings and God is stirring up and pulling things out of your heart and saying, I don't like that. I want to deal with that. I want to get rid of that attitude. That thing is ugly. Let's deal with that, right? This is a season that Matthias was in for three years. So maybe you're feeling like, man, it's been years and it just isn't happening. It isn't happening. It isn't happening. Honor the season that God has put you in. Embrace the season that God has put you in, even if it is a season of preparation, because you will get to your moment like Matthias did where you began to bloom. So Everybody knows I love documentaries. It's true. It's true. <clears throat> but I don't just love documentaries. 
My favorite website, um, yeah, I, would, yeah, I would say that, yeah, my favorite website on the whole of the internet is Wikipedia. I love Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the coolest website. I'm so glad it's free. If it wasn't, I'd pay for it for sure. I've got Wikipedia on my desktop computer. I've got it on my laptop computer. I've got it on my tablet. I've got it on my phone. I tried to install it on my watch because you know you never know when you need to do some research when you're sitting down on your watch. I love Wikipedia. When I was writing this sermon, I had a quick squiz at how many tabs I had just on Wikipedia. 32 tabs on Wikipedia, right? I am that guy. So what happens is I go on Wikipedia, and for those who don't know, it's an online encyclopedia, right? Uh, nerd alert, hello. Um, so what happens is I'll click on one thing and I'll be reading about it and I'll go, hmm, and then I'll click on another thing and then I'll go, hmm, and before long I'm, I'm researching some bizarre thing that makes no sense, like the migration pattern of geese or um, uh, I was researching different formats that they've sold music on that weren't popular, that died. You know, I just thought that was fascinating. So I was researching strange things that happened in 2008. I, looking back, I don't even know why. I guess God was in the random details. Um, so I'm researching strange things that happened in 2008. And I found out that they discovered this plant in 2008 by accident, right? And it's called the Madagascan palm. It grows to an enormous size. It's a palm tree, right? It grows to an enormous size, right? And it produces fruit. And the Madagascan palm had been there for a very, very long time. In fact, the scientist, the horticulturalist who went and studied this, figured out that it actually only blooms once every 100 years, about. They're still starting. They don't have another 100 years yet to know. They, they, they guesstimate once every 100 years, right? So this plant that was completely unknown became famous overnight because out of nowhere it decided to bloom. So I was thinking about that. I did a bit of research on this plant, as I do. Thank you, Wikipedia. Thank you, horticulture blogs, because then I went and was reading up on horticulture blogs and using Wikipedia for all the terms I didn't understand, right? So... Think about this, a hundred years ago, before the First World War even began, when the major mode of transport between nations was people on boats, like old school boats, not like motorboats, not like a jet ski. I mean like wind in the sails type, you know, Ara Maharti's pirate type boats, right? So Madagascar is a small little island off the coast of Africa. And people were going in and out of this island. People were walking past this plant every single day and they weren't noticing that it was there. All the other flowers in the garden, all the other roses and all the other things in Madagascar were blooming and were drawing people's attention, but people walked past the Madagascar palm, they didn't even know it was there. First World War happens, Second World War happens, Vietnam War happens, decades go by, people come and go, they walk past this plant. Summer comes, this flower blooms. Spring comes a year later, this flower blooms. Five years later, another plant that takes its time blooms. And I bet you for the Madagascan palm, it would have felt like its moment was never coming. So invisible, such a nobody was this plant that everybody didn't even realize it existed. It didn't even get catalogued as they were cataloging all the other botany in the, uh, on the island. They missed this plant, beautiful tropical island. Everybody going to Madagascar because it's one of the most beautiful islands off the coast of Africa. But even when people are going to this beautiful island, they're ignoring this plant. They're not realizing that this plant exists. Decades come, decades come, season after season after season. But the Madagascan palm had something going for it. It was in a season of preparation. <clears throat> what I love about plants is this. Plants embrace the season that they're in, right? You don't see a plant, plant wrestling with the season, going, this season doesn't agree with me. I don't like this season. Let's take a vote on who should boycott this season. Plants embrace the season that they're in. So the plant is embracing the season of preparation. Slowly it's grinding it out. Slowly it's growing this flower. Decades go past, more decades go past, the modern technology means that aeroplanes are the main mode of transport between nations. So people are flying in Europe, they're catching high speed trains. Japan builds its first bullet train, goes at hundreds of kilometers an hour. Here's the Madagascan palm waiting for its moment to bloom. Finally, we get to the year 2000, the millennium, Y2K, right? Who remembers that? That was fun. And, um, and, and sure enough, the Madagascan plant is still there, still grinding it out, still in a season of preparation. 
A few years past, the first smartphones hit the world. <clears throat> the internet has blown up. Facebook becomes a thing. MySpace was a thing back then. Even MSN Messenger, I'm looking at you all the MSN kids back in the day, they're only not kids anymore. Anyone who remembers MSN is old, um, like me. But finally, the moment comes. It's 2008. We live in the 24 hour news cycle where everything and anything is news. And out of nowhere, the Madagascan palm pops open the most beautiful flower. And people stop and say to themselves, what's that? And they began to look at it. They began to study it. You know, it made world headlines, this plant. It went from being a nobody to a somebody. Everybody was talking about it. I didn't even realize that this was a thing, but the Madagascan plant actually won a horticultural award. Yes, it's not a person, it's a thing, it's a plant, but it won a horticulture award. It won an award, it got worldwide fame. People began to study it, people began to obsess over this plant who had waited 100 years to bloom. It was on satellite television. Its images of this beautiful plant were beamed all over the world, a technology that did not exist 100 years beforehand. People were talking about it in midair over airplanes as they flew over the nations in Africa. Again, technology that didn't exist. People photographed it with digital SLRs and live streamed it using their modern smartphones. Again, technology that didn't exist. It waited 100 years of seasons of preparations that would come and go until it had its moment to bloom. You know, it's all about seasons. Not every flower blooms in every season. Not every flower blooms every year even. And maybe you're being prepared for a season to come. Maybe God has got you in a season right now where you're just being prepared because you are gonna bloom, but your blooming isn't gonna happen in this season. Maybe it's gonna take a little while. Maybe you're being tested. Maybe you're being stretched. Maybe God's challenging some of the things in your heart. Let me encourage you, don't give up too early. Don't bail too early. It takes years to bloom. Don't give up too early. Sometimes it takes years to bloom. You know, Matthias was amazing. He planted churches. He spread the gospel. He trained disciples. He baptized people. You know, he was like a Coke can that was all shaken up, just waiting for his moment. And this is the moment that it went... And, you know, Coke went everywhere, right? Um, Matthias was an incredible, bold proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He relished his opportunity. He absolutely bloomed. He made Jesus famous in parts of the world where they thought that they were never, ever going to get any traction for the gospel. There are churches to this day who can trace their roots back to Matthias' ministry. He was picked for a moment like this. He had his moment to bloom. And like the Madagascan palm, boy, did he bloom. But he had to to grind it out for three years. See, he was feeling like, I'm sure I'm being rejected, I'm being looked over, but that's not what was happening at all. What actually was happening was he was waiting for his moment to bloom and he was in a season of preparation. He was in a season where God was chipping away at him. Don't give up too early. Don't bail too early. Don't quit too early. Don't say, this didn't work out for me. Hey, I was grieving and it didn't actually, you know, like I was waiting a few weeks, it didn't actually get better. I was going for that promotion. I got knocked back a couple of times. I was believing for that girl to say, yes, yeah. she said, no, don't give up too early. Keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep hustling. Because guess what? Uh, sometimes it takes years to bloom. I don't know where you find yourself today. Maybe you've been waiting years for your healing or years for the right job or <clears throat> years for somebody special, years for a promotion. Uh, and maybe you're waiting years for that breakthrough to come, that expansion to come, years for that door of opportunity to open. Maybe you feel like Matthias did. After three years, don't, don't let yourself fall into the competition trap. You know, Matthias didn't feel like he was up against everybody else for a spot. He knew that God was the one choosing his destiny. God is the one writing your destiny too. God is the one writing your future. Don't feel like you need to get sucked into the competition trap. You're not up against anybody else. Check your heart, deal with your heart, deal with your attitude to other people. And at the right time, God will elevate you. You know, um, maybe you feel like as seasons are coming and going, like nothing is actually happening. Like I bet you for that Madagascan palm, year after year, it felt like nothing was happening. But God was in the details for that palm. God was weaving things together and growing things. And it was so small that nobody else noticed, but God noticed and that plant noticed. So maybe you're a bit like that. You're like, man, where is God in all, the, all of my life? I'm telling you, God is in moving. God is doing something. He's just in the details. He's in the little things. He's in the things that you gloss over. Or maybe you're watching this and you're like, man, I'm worn out. Like, I'm tired. Like, I get what you're saying. I'm just over it. 
hey, I hear you, I hear what you're saying, but here's my encouragement. Don't give up, don't quit, don't bail, keep pushing, keep hustling as the kids say, keep grinding it out because your moment is coming. Sometimes it takes years to bloom. Be like the Madagascan palm, steal the limelight and the attention when your moment comes, but don't give up in the season before that. The world is full of seasons. Maybe you're in a season that's testing you. Maybe you're in a season that God is chipping away at some of the rough edges of your life. Embrace the season that you're in. Not every season is about blooming. Um, And yes, it's a long battle. Yes, it takes its time. But in due season, you will reap a reward. Hallelujah. I just want to pray for people right now. I want to pray for two groups of people. First group of people I want to pray for is people who need Jesus. If you're watching this, I'm not asking you if you've watched a sermon before, if you've read a Bible verse, if you grew up going to church. I'm asking, is Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life? Lord means he's in charge and Savior means he forgives you for everything you've ever done. And come on, let's get real. Um, God, God knows that it's the truth. We know that it's the truth. We've all done some silly things. We all need Jesus, right? The Bible calls those mistakes sin, but you know we've all sinned. We, we, we know that. Well, that's why we need Jesus. We need a Lord because otherwise we make silly decisions. We need to present stuff to God and say, do you think I should do this or do you think I should do that? So I want to pray for you if you need Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never prayed this prayer before or maybe you have prayed the prayer before, but if you're honest, you've kind of gone off and done your own thing. It's like you're in a relationship and you kind of need to get back to basics. You need to rekindle that relationship. Here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to pray for you right where you are. I'm going to get you to repeat after me. Um, you know, it's, you don't even need to be here, be in the room because it's not about me. It's just about you and Jesus. At the end of that prayer, you're going to be a Christian and everything I preach today will be true for you and true for your life. So come on, let's pray. Dear Jesus, please come into my life as Lord and Savior. Help me to follow you all my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's chuck some streamers in the chat room and some hand emojis, your favorite dancing gif. Uh, If you've made that decision, either for the first time or the thousandth time, it doesn't matter. We want you to know we're so happy for you. We're thrilled. It would make my day if you um, typed in the chat or you inboxed us or you contacted us or whatever. We'd love to hear about it. It's a great decision. It's super exciting. It's better than winning the lottery. So that is awesome. Let us know about that. The second group of people I want to very quickly pray for is I want to pray for people who uh, I just get a sense in my spirit who feel like you're just grinding it out. You're like Matthias in the three-year period. You haven't got your moment to bloom yet. Maybe you feel like you're in competition with everybody else or maybe you feel like, man, where where is God in all this? Even though he's in the details, you can't see it or maybe you just feel like it's just taken a long time, you know? I just want to pray for you right now. If that's you, you, if if you're on a jog and you're podcasting, hold your phone tightly or whatever you're listening to. If you're on the chat, why don't you stretch your hands towards the screen? I'm going to pray for you right now. Um, Dear Jesus, we just thank you so much, Lord Jesus, that you're doing something in their life. God, I pray right now that you help them get out of that competition mindset, that you help them see that it's not a competition when God is choosing. God, if they're grinding it out and they're not seeing you, Lord God, help them to be aware of your presence in the details, aware of what you're doing in the details. Lord Jesus, if you're in their midst, Lord God, and they're ready to give up, God, I pray that you'd encourage them. You give them a supernatural fresh wind, a fresh touch of the Holy Ghost, Lord Jesus, so that they can push, they can grind, they can do it again, and they can wait for their moment to bloom. And Lord God, I pray right now, just like the Madagascan palm, just like Matthias, Lord Jesus, when their moment comes, may it be fantastic. May it be worth the wait, Lord Jesus. May them relish the opportunity that you're putting in front of them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for coming to church today online. I really appreciate it. Or podcasting this, if you podcasted it, if you didn't uh, see last week's message, make sure you check that out. It'll change your life. God bless you. We'll see you next week.